not only are they going to stay with you and they expect that, but they want you to have every meal with them and take them around. I can't, I don't do that anymore. Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Welcome to The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. And today we are again coming to you from a different location, just like last podcast, because I have got visitors in town. And so today you have the privilege of hearing us in Tiffany's apartment, which is just about two blocks from Katie's apartment. (laughs) That's right. Uh, It's a little bigger, as you can hear as well. She lives in a nicer place because she had time to look around and find a good apartment. Anyway, like I said, I have visitors in the house. When I left to come over here to talk with Tiffany, both my husband and my sister were sound asleep. So we probably could have done the podcast in the middle of the room and neither one of them would have noticed because Derek was wearing earplugs and Sarah was wearing headphones. So... I think probably it's still a better idea to do it here, just in case they wake up. Yeah. So I have been absolutely inundated with visitors lately. My parents just left Rome yesterday after being here for about 10, maybe a little bit more days. And my sister arrived the very same day, later on in the day. So they flew out around 10 a.m. My sister arrived at 3.30 p.m. So I had the uh, five hour or so break in the middle of the day (laughs) before saying goodbye to one, greeting the other. Now your sister's staying with you, right? She's staying with me, yes. My parents stayed in a hotel. Thank God. (laughs) No offense, but you know, it's it's a small place. Yeah, I live in a studio apartment. A studio apartment that's literally probably the size of this colossal sounding room. Which is not as big as she's making it sound, by the way. It's about (laughs) 20 square meters this room, I think. I, I don't know how much that is in feet anymore. Sorry. Uh, I so If I sound like I'm dragging a little bit today, it's because I have been the ultimate tour guide for the last 11 or so days. And I still have, well, let's see, my sister just got here yesterday. So I have two weeks to go as we, nice. as we speak. And after she leaves, I have two days where no one's in town. And then Derek's cousins arrive and they're going to be here for another week at least, and they're staying with us for half of the time mm-hmm. that they're here. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but when I have guests in town, when I have visitors in town, I feel like I have to take them around and show them all of the sites, and it can be really exhausting. <laughs> have you had to do that a lot? Yes, I have. In fact, I've actually started making a tour. What I did with my sister today was almost exactly what I did with my parents the very first day they were here. Wow, a natural tour guide. (laughs) So where do you start when you have people coming? Oh, that's a good question. It really depends if they've been here or not. You know, my my parents have been here eight times or something. So I don't really actually have to do anything for them. I'm I'm, I'm lucky that way. But if I let's say I have a friend coming who's never been to Rome, what is the first place that I take them? Just for sheer shock value, I might take them to the Pantheon first, just because it's so impressive. The Pantheon or the Colosseum, I would say. But if someone arrives at night, like when my sisters came to visit, my two oldest half-sisters came to visit. They'd never been out of Europe before. And they're both in their 50s. And we... They'd never been out of the U.S. before. You said Europe. Oh, oops. Sorry. They had never been to Europe before. See, I'm starting to go the other way, as you said. Um, They had been out of... America, but never out of North America. So when they arrived, we, my husband and I picked them up and we took them immediately in the car on like a night, like a, just a drive through Rome by night, which I think is a great thing to do. If you, obviously you have to have a, a vehicle to do this, or, you know, you could pay a taxi to take you around. It might be a little pricey though. And that's a great thing, you know, just drive by, you know, then of course, later on you go back to these sites and you see them properly, but that's a fun thing to do. What do you think is so impressive about the Pantheon? Uh, well, I guess because it's so well preserved. You're used to seeing pictures of ancient monuments in Egypt or in Greece or even in Rome, you know, that are dilapidated and falling apart and four columns standing on one side and two columns on the other side. When you go to the Pantheon and you see the entire thing perfectly intact, 
standing there like time has stopped in the middle of the city too. It's not like when you go to Athens and you have to go to the old part of the city and see all of the ancient sites. In Rome, they're right in the middle of the city and the city has grown up around them. So you're walking down a tiny little street with 18th century or 19th century buildings on either side. All of a sudden you turn into a piazza and the Pantheon is right in front of you at eye level. And for people who don't know how old the Pantheon is? The final version, because it did burn down a couple times, but the final version that we have today was built in the second century AD, like 120 something, 122, 117 actually, I think 117, but don't quote me on that. It was around that time. That was one of my first stops. My other first stop was Piazza Navona, three fountains, nice church. It's probably the most picturesque square in the world, I think. It's just, it's just beautiful. It's just, you can't, you can't argue with that. It's just beautiful. It is beautiful, and it kind of has a little bit of everything Rome offers. It's got fountains, it's got churches, outdoor obelisk. cafe life. Yeah, an obelisk, and it's got an ancient past, too. This was the Stadium of Domitian back in the day. That's a good choice, yeah. definitely. And so then where you said you'd kind of come up with a tour, so it starts there, and then where did it go? Well, it starts in Campo de Fiore, mm-hmm. where they used to burn people, and now they have a market. And that's just because it's one of the closest things to where we are living, which is interesting. Right? So you just weave through there, Pantheon, Piazza Navona. And then with my parents, they don't walk as fast as my sister does. So we saw a lot more with her today than my parents did. But with my sister, she wanted to visit the Trevi Fountain, which I knew would be overrun by tourists. But what can you do? What can you do? No, I have a friend who I've actually talked about on this podcast before, the one who had problems in London, if you remember. And she's lived here for years and years. She's been a tour guide for pretty much that entire time. And she says when she has family or friends visiting, she has a motto. I don't do the Colosseum. I don't do the Trevi Fountain. (laughs) And she refuses to take people to those two sites. She just puts her foot down. And, you know, I have to hand it to her. It's After you've lived in a city for that many years, and especially if you do tourism as a job, you do not want to go to the Pantheon, not to the Pantheon, I'm sorry, the, the Trevi Fountain. I will go to the Pantheon any day of the week. It's just too wonderful and too beautiful, you know. But the, the Trevi Fountain, which is also beautiful, don't get me wrong, but it's, like you were saying, so crowded and just so full of people trying to sell every possible thing into your face. No, to go there when you're not working and when you have seen it 3,000 times, no, just not, just don't go there. But obviously, you've been here in less than a year, so you probably haven't been too, you know, exhausted by the Trevi Fountain yet, I'm hoping. Well, I've also had wonderful, well, one wonderful occasion there where I had gotten up really early one morning to walk Derek to school where he's studying. Rome doesn't really get going super early in the morning, so things were still thin. I was walking for about a half an hour. I happened to walk past the Trevi Fountain. And there was no one there. What time was it? It was maybe 8, 8 in the morning. One or two people stopping by to take a picture every now and then, but tourist season was low at the time. And I stopped, and I had a notebook with me, and I just sat down and wrote, sitting on one of the benches there, you know, my own private gigantic fountain in front of me. And that was actually a pretty nice moment. So now when I go, and like usual, there's the hordes, there I can at least remember what it was like to sit in front of the Trevi Fountain by myself and write. That's amazing. That If more people realize that, if more tourists realize that you just got to do one of two things. You have to either get up insanely early or you have to stay up insanely late. And you have to obviously not come at high season. But I had an experience like that myself. But it was actually in high season. It was summer. And I happened to be out with a bunch of friends very, very late and riding bikes through the center of Rome at about three in the morning. I can't remember why, but we ended up at the Trevi Fountain at about, I guess, three or three thirty or four, maybe at the latest. And we just sat in front of the Trevi Fountain. It was the same thing. There was no one there, but it was the middle of the night. It was incredible. It's an incredible thing to do, especially if you're a photographer. Just make the sacrifice. Get up early or stay up until the middle of the night and you will have the entire city to yourself. It's so true, because I got to see Piazza Navona that same way, four in the morning, no one else there. You were jet-lagged, right? Yes. Yes. A story I've already told on this podcast, so if you're just joining us, 
go back and catch up, right? Now, I wanted to ask you, so you've had, as far as visitors since you've been here, it's really, correct me if I'm wrong, it's really only been your parents and your sister, right? Yes, they are the first. They are the first. Because, I mean, there's one, it's one thing when your parents or your sister comes or your brother, that kind of thing. You know, you have to take them around. It's an obligation. But let's talk about what happens when a friend of a friend comes or a friend who you're just not that close with and they come to the city and they don't stay with you, you know, but they come to the city and you get together and they expect you to take them around as if you were their private tour guide. You obviously haven't had experience with this. What would you do? I wonder if I will, though, because next after my sister are Derek's cousins, people that I've only met on my wedding day. Well, I would say in that case that it's going to be his duty then to take them around, right? And I'm really looking forward to that, yes. Because <laughs> right now, it is really it's my on, duty. It's on you. Uh, but I still think it will a little bit be that same way because I I just don't know them very well. Now, do you have any other friends coming in town that are not family or that are not super close friends either? Uh, no. No. So I don't know. How would I deal with that? What do you do? Do you just say, oh, I've got to go to work? Yeah, that's a good excuse to say that you have to go to work. But I've had many different experiences. I've had super, super close friends that are such close friends of mine that it was actually a joy to take them around. It can be a tiring joy, but it's gratifying. Gratifying the same way being a tour guide is gratifying. And I don't know if I've mentioned that I have worked as a tour guide for many years, although it's not my main job now. But being a tour guide, even if you don't know the people, when you see someone truly interested in what you're talking about and start to understand the city, because Rome is a city that's incredibly beautiful and anybody can see that. But when you start to understand and get deeper into the layers of the history and the, the true fabric of the city, it's incredible. And it opens up, it makes everything you're seeing so much more interesting and more alive. And so when you can start to convey that to people and they get it, and it fascinates them, and you see that spark in their eye, it's very fun, and it's satisfying. But I've had other times when I've taken people around who are just kind of like, mm, okay, yeah, it's all right. They don't say that to me, but you can kind of tell that they're not blown away by these things that I'm obviously blown away by every single day. So that can be a little bit boring. Or then you get this whole other type of visitor because you knew each other once, or you knew each other in college, let's say, not only are they going to stay with you, and they expect that, but they want you to have every meal with them and take them around. I can't. I don't do that anymore. Well, you're married now, so that's a good excuse. It is. It is. But even before I was married, I had a friend who was someone who I was actually quite close with and really, really liked in college. And I moved here, and we just lost touch, as you do. Then, of course, Facebook happened, and so we kind of found each other through Facebook. But as I'm sure everybody in the world who's on Facebook or has been can relate to, there are people that you're on Facebook with that you might have been close with once, but you never have any communications with. Nothing. Not even the birthday messages. Nothing. And so that was kind of how it was with this girl. We were on Facebook together, but we never communicated. And years and years and years went by. And I wrote to her out of the blue, and I just said wanted to see how you're doing and hope you're well and that I missed her. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't use that word because I didn't actually miss her, but that whatever, you know, I was thinking about her. Well, she didn't write back for about six months. <laughs> I honestly didn't really think of it. Then I get a message from her six months later. Oh, hi, how are you doing? Thanks for your sweet message. I feel the same way, etc., etc. I'm thinking of coming to Rome for my birthday. I was thinking from May 10th to May 20th. What do you think? Can I come visit you? Would I be able to stay with you? I thought, are you kidding? I wrote you this message. You didn't even respond. And now because you want to come to Rome, now we're friends again? So I, I wrote her back and I said that I was really sorry that I had a tiny apartment and I didn't have space, which was kind of true. I, I mean, I had a roommate and... My boyfriend was often staying over, my husband now. And so I just said, I'm sorry, I really don't have space. I don't even have a sofa, which I think was a lie. But, you know, I didn't have an actual extra room. She never wrote me back. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know. The thing was, I did say, I said, you know, I'll, I know a lot of places where you can stay for not a lot of money. I can help you find a place. And I'll definitely take you around and we can go out to eat. It wasn't a total brush off. It was just, I'm really sorry. I can't have you stay in my place, but I can't wait to see you sort of thing. Never heard from her again. 
Wow. That's harsh. Yeah. Well, when you live in a such a desirable place, like and I'm sure people who live in Paris and people who live on the beach in Bermuda would be able to relate to this, that when you live in an amazing city, people come out of the woodwork, people who you haven't heard from in many, many years because they want to come stay with you. I'm actually surprised that hasn't happened to you guys yet. We had a lot of people in the run up to leaving all excited about coming we're like everybody should come visit us now we're really glad that a lot of people didn't take us up on that offer but (laughs) we could have certainly ended up that way but i think it's because we're only here for such a short time it takes a while for people to get their stuff together enough to plan a trip and go somewhere when it's your family i think that they have more of a push behind them they don't just want an excuse to come to rome they also want to see where you're living and what your life is like now I was kind of hoping that more good friends would decide to come. When you're living abroad, you don't just miss your family in that first year. You also miss the people who are your best friends of quite course, a bit. Of course. Yeah. And so I wish that more of them had decided to come. Maybe not one right after another, but as a big group, that would have been nice. Yeah. Too bad I'm not getting married this year. I know. Come on, Tiffany. <laughs> Renewal of vows. Okay. <laughs> We're running out of time, but I did want to ask you something else. One question I've been asking myself a lot when I'm giving all these tours, and this is particularly good because you're a tour guide, so I've got a lot of knowledge in my head now about how things are here. You've got 10 times that amount of knowledge. And the question I keep asking myself is, how many of these stories do you tell them? Or how many times do you, as you're walking down the street, having a conversation about something else, just go, hey, by the way, that's the oldest standing building in Rome right there. Or, oh, we're now walking on the oldest bridge in Rome, 2 BC. Uh, you know, how often do you throw all those little details at people? All the time. All the time. I do it with my husband. I was just hanging out with a friend of mine named Amy, who I'm hoping that we'll be able to interview in the next few, week or two. And she's lived here a long time, but she's not a tour guide and she's not as interested. I mean, she is interested, but it's not her, let's say, number one passion is studying Rome. And we were walking around Trastevere and we walked past this little street called Vicolo dell'Atleta which is one of my favorite streets in Rome, which I couldn't resist. I said, oh, come this way. I want to show you something. And I explained to her the ancient synagogue and the ancient statue that was found in the basement and how now it's a restaurant and the basement is a wine cellar and you can go and see it. And, and the street is named after the statue that was found there. And I can't really help myself. I'm not really doing it for their benefit necessarily. I like to tell these stories. I guess that's a good thing considering my profession. <laughs> Yeah, considering you make money telling people these stories. Actually, I was thinking it would be interesting on one of these podcasts for you and me to go to certain locations and just tell the salacious stories in those locations. Oh, that sounds like a great idea. (laughs) It does really depend on the person because I think that my sister today enjoyed more of my stories, particularly because you and I are sort of obsessed with art from the Renaissance, or at least I am at the moment, you know, I and sure. I love telling the stories about, oh, and here's where Raphael is buried, and then going off about his his life, and my sister seemed more interested in that than my parents did, right, where they're just more, oh, whatever, let's go see something else, and my dad, I asked him what he thought of Rome, and he actually came around a little bit by the end, but he said, I don't I don't remember his exact words, so this is not a quote, but I don't know that I really like it. He was trying to explain that there's something about thinking a lot about the different things that happened here, you know, that he studied over his lifetime. He's a retired Presbyterian minister, so a lot of things of the biblical era happened around this area. Also, being interested in Caesar and all those people. And he said, there's just something about having all that in your head And then seeing where the things actually happened and having it be nothing like that anymore. That the city has moved on. There is no sacred space. Where Caesar was killed doesn't exist anymore. It's long gone. There was something about that that disturbed him that made him not as happy with the city as he might have been. Whereas you kind of delight in going, this is where Caesar is killed and now it's a big roadway. Everybody enjoy. Well, it's not that I enjoy that the site was asphalted and covered up, but what I enjoy is to see the different layers of the city. Obviously, if you could visit a site that had been perfectly preserved the way that it was. Caesar's blood still on the ground. (laughs) if If you could do that, that would be unbelievable. And that's why going to places like Pompeii and Herculeum 
which are not perfectly preserved by any means, but they're very well preserved because of certain things that happened in that case, because of the eruption of Vesuvius frozen in time and nothing was built over it. And so that has its merits. And I think that's an amazing thing to see. But in Rome, I think what makes Rome unique is that it did continue. It has a unbroken history of 3000 years. It has been continually inhabited for 3000 years. I think that makes it more fascinating. Obviously, it's a shame that certain sites were just completely destroyed. A lot of time it was because of people who should have known better, to be honest, popes in the 1600s, 1700s, who really should have known better. Maybe not the 1700s, but up to the 1600s for sure. But other times it was because progression of time. People were living here in in ancient times. Their home was deserted. People in the Middle Ages, two, three hundred years later, had to find a place to live. It, It was a very difficult time, so they moved in. They used the ancient site to build their home, and that eventually developed into something else. Just one layer on top of the other, it's what makes Rome fascinating, I think. Well, and frankly, it's also, it's not just that. It's that the way that we feel about preserving sites is different now. In the past, my understanding, as far as archaeology is concerned, this isn't something that people were doing all along. This is an amazing place. Let's preserve it. And a lot of the things in Rome are, if a building is really, really old and it's in good shape, it's generally because the church took it over. The Pantheon is still in good shape because the church was paying. Well, the Pantheon became a church. That's why it was. Right. But I mean, if it had stayed a temple to the gods that people aren't worshiping anymore, then eventually it would have fallen into disrepair more than it did being taken over by a group that was still in power. Oh, absolutely. That's the reason. That is the reason that the Pantheon is still in perfect condition was because it became a church. It was no longer open to being despoiled. (laughs) But I think it's great that there are some sites that are perfectly preserved, like the Pantheon, and, and there are some others that are maybe not perfectly preserved, but you can see the entire site. But I think that you can't expect a modern city to stop. I mean, Rome has stopped anyway. It really stopped around 1900. Nothing really has changed in Rome, with very few exceptions, in the center of Rome. And there's, you know, the neighborhood of Aeor to the south that was completely developed in the time of Mussolini. Other than that, there's really nothing in Rome that's changed since about 1900. Obviously, I'm glad in a way, because Rome is so amazing because it's so old and because of all of the things if you turned it into berlin or tokyo or new york that would be pointless but on the other hand a city still has to be livable you should progress in a certain extent and it's a difficult it's a very difficult and delicate question yes because as it is now the whole center downtown center of rome is an archaeological dig essentially and all the cars have to drive around it in a big circle to get to work so yeah. in that way, it's kind of inconvenient. No, it's very inconvenient. But I mean, I can really see both sides of the, of the issue, that that is very convenient and people need to get to work and, you know, there's no metro. Well, there is a metro in Rome, but it's not very good because all the ruins underground. But if Rome had been completely deserted at the fall of Rome, 479, I think is the date, if everybody had left Rome, the only way that the city could have stayed the way it was is if everybody had left But if everybody had left, it would be gone. It would be completely gone. There would be nothing left. Maybe one or two temples. Really, there would be nothing left. The reason that Rome has survived is because people stayed there and because people built a house into the temple or built a church into a temple. It wouldn't have survived otherwise. It would have been ghost town. I think that the change that came about was necessary. It was a necessary evil. And I think Rome is beautiful because, not in spite of all of the changes that came after. Hmm. Going back to our visitor quandary before we end. Sorry, that was a, a big bit of a tangent. No, no, tangents are good. So when you have visitors come and they don't see all this stuff to appreciate, like you appreciate, do you find that you feel differently about those visitors? I don't know if I've changed my opinion of them as people, but it bothers me. It definitely bothers me if, if somebody is lackadaisical, is that the right word? And I guess that's not the right Ambivalent. If someone is ambivalent about the city, I almost get offended as if they're talking about my mom, you know? <laughs> and uh, 
but I don't think I would necessarily change my opinion of them. Without offending anyone, I think if you can't recognize the beauty of Rome, you don't really have eyes. How could you not? I have a friend who we were walking, she's as well lived in Rome for many, many years, and we were walking home from having an aperitivo, and we passed through the Piazza della Rotonda, where the Pantheon is. It was nighttime, and both of us have seen the Pantheon probably thousands of times, and and she stopped, and she looked up at it, and we looked like two tourists, and she said, you know, I think if you stop, walk by the Pantheon without looking at it, you might as well not be alive anymore. We'll leave it there, and just to be clear, my dad does like Rome. <laughs> All right, all right, because I was about to say, I don't know if I can hang out with your dad anymore. Yeah, I don't want to throw him under the bus. <laughs> it was a city he liked. We'll leave it there. Uh, I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. This is The Bittersweet Life. Check out our website, thebittersweetlife.net. And leave us a comment. If you have any ideas for uh, what we should talk about, let us know. Bye-bye. We welcome your questions and your feedback. Reach the show by emailing. Hi, it's Katie. Bittersweet Treating life you to another lunchtime concert. Bittersweetlife at M-A-I-L dot com. Just taking a moment to remind you of different things you can do to support the show. Number one, if you're coming to Rome, let's not forget that Tiffany is an excellent tour guide. Find her at the pinesofrome.blogspot.com. There's a link on our website, thebittersweetlife.net, and you can have her personally drag you around the city. And you can consider supporting us. There's a donate button on our website. It helps us pay the bills and keep this podcast going without too much loss for us. And support us also by telling your friends. Spread the word. Thanks so much for spending all this time with us. 